Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the Primary Care Podcast. It is your boy, Dr. Mark List. Before we get into today's episode, we're going to hit up the primarycarepod at gmail.com inbox to get a joke from you, the listener, uh, as we go forward. Again, always appreciate comments, feedback. Uh, so let's jump into it today, uh, pulling up the primarycarepod at gmail.com inbox right now. Uh, and let's see here. All right, uh, Dr. List, I got a joke for you. Smoking will kill you. Bacon will also kill you. But smoking bacon will cure it. All right, that's a good one. Uh, you can send me a joke at primarycarepod at gmail.com inbox, uh, and uh, let's uh, let's start the podcast. The Primary Care Podcast is written and edited by a family physician for an audience of other physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, residents, and medical students interested in primary care topics. This is not a podcast for patients. It should not be used as medical advice. This is also a personal podcast, produced in my own time and solely reflecting my personal opinions. Statements of this podcast do not reflect the views or policies of my employer, past or present, or any other organization with which I may be affiliated. Thank you for listening to the Primary Care Podcast. I'm Dr. Mark List, here to bring you the latest news, guidelines, and updates from primary care sources around the globe. Keeping it under 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and I'm not that smart. Well, welcome back to the podcast, pod girls, pod boys, pod people. It is your boy, Dr. Mark List, your favorite podcasting host. Uh, yes, sorry, that was a little bit longer break between episodes than normal. Uh, understand that, you know, sometimes life gets in the way. Uh, so before we get into today's episode, I, I wanted to appreciate all the uh, the feedback we've been getting. Uh, super, super happy with the amount of listeners that we've been growing. So um, again, couldn't be couldn't be more proud of something that I, I've literally never uh, advertised or or worked at uh, trying to spread the word. So uh, thanks for the uh, word of mouth re- uh, referrals. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, today, you know, we are talking about something that, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast. I am a nihilist. I, I don't like to prescribe medications if possible. I like trying to do as little as possible. And it pains me it doesn't pain me. It, it, it pains me to recommend that we do things uh, that we don't normally do and we add to the list of things that we should consider doing. But in this case, I, I think it bears further conversation into the fact that SGLT2s are great medicines. They are not great medicines for diabetes, which is hilarious that, you know, drug companies, when they tried to research these, that, hey, this is a new drug uh, target for diabetes. Because diabetes is a huge moneymaker for them, and they're charging three, four hundred dollars a month for this drug, and it lowers A1C by half a point to one point three points per patient, depends on the trial you read. So again, not overly impressive A1C reductions. And so I think though it needs to be said, we've talked in the past that SGLT2s are basically a heart failure drug that also reduces your A1C because they are tremendous drugs for heart failure patients. And and I think a lot of cardiologists are going to be using them first line, whether the patient now has diabetes or not, based on how good of treatment they are for heart failure. And we've also talked about how good they are for chronic kidney disease, especially associated with diabetes. We had a whole episode about microalbuminuria and chronic kidney disease and proteinuria in diabetic patients and how SGLT2s, aside from lowering A1C, SGLT2s are just like lisinopril in that they do help to protect the kidneys. But this was a study done really not that long ago, uh, here in 2021, from the uh, Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology Journal. And the title is, Effects of Dapoglifosin on Major Adverse Kidney and Cardiovascular Events in Patients with Diabetic and Non-Diabetic Chronic Kidney Disease. So this goes back to the DAPA CKD trial and looks at not just diabetic chronic kidney disease, but this looks at, you know, so this was a double double blind placebo randomized control trial. Um, numerous, numerous patients. There's over 386 clinics. You know, there's the N is in the 4,000s, 4,300 to 2,000 each group. And this was a trial they looked at, but then they looked at the data analysis of non or, or, or all people with chronic kidney disease, but some that aren't even specifically uh, diabetic related uh, also. So not only di- uh, diabetic nephropathy, but also glomer- glomerulonephritides. Ooh, I hate that word. Glomerulonephritides, ischemic and hypertensive chronic kidney disease, and chronic kidney disease of unknown cause, aka seemingly all of my patients with chronic kidney disease who don't have diabetes and high blood pressure. Uh, uh, you know, they, they get in this garbage bag of like, we don't know why you have chronic kidney disease, but you do. Or at least the EMR in, in this case and the patients that, you know, didn't know why they had chronic kidney disease. And when you look at the outcomes, 
pretty statistically, pretty, pretty amazing reduction in what the study looked at in terms of the four primary outcomes. And the composite primary outcome was a, uh, you know, they didn't want to see patients with a 50% reduction in their GFR. Okay. So the baseline patient in the study was somewhere around a GFR of 45. Again, already, already has chronic kidney disease, significant chronic kidney disease, and they didn't want to see a 50% reduction. Okay. They didn't want to see the, the next primary endpoint was progression to end stage renal disease, which they uh, specified as a GFR under 15, being on dialysis or needing kidney transplantation. Number three primary outcome was kidney related death. Number four was cardiovascular death. And compared to placebo, there was a dramatic reduction in this primary composite outcome, okay, among all patients with chronic kidney disease. And we're talking about an absolute risk reduction of about three percentage points. So a number needed to treat around 34. 33 to 34 depends on the outcome. And that and and so that was the composite of all the primary outcomes, but even the individual uh, outcomes uh, all looked really, really good in terms of their reduction. Some did not meet statistical significance by themselves because they were so rare. For example, like kidney transplantation uh, literally happened three in the placebo group and one in the kidney transplant uh, or one in the diploglifosin group. So didn't meet statistical significance, but uh, oh, actually it did. Just kidding. Uh, the uh, hazard ratio did not cross one. Um, but all of them combined had a very had a very good outcome. And the craziest part about this is, even though you know 60% of the patients in the study were diabetic chronic kidney disease, it didn't matter if it was diabetic chronic kidney disease or hypertensive chronic kidney disease or glomerulonephritis or, or unknown cause of the chronic kidney disease. All patients with chronic kidney disease had less reduction in their GFR, right? Had less progression to chronic kidney disease, had less kidney-related death and cardiovascular death, which is pretty fantastic, pretty fantastic um, numbers. So basically, it it doesn't matter if your patient has hypertensive chronic kidney disease. If you're looking for another agent, aside from an ACE inhibitor, and we talked about lowering blood pressure, um, keeping blood pressure in control for your diabetic chronic kidney disease, we talked about all the indications and all the reasons, you know, how you can do that, basically managing their diabetes as good as possible, look back to the previous podcast. But in this study, it didn't matter what else you did, the drug itself. And so there's clearly a class effect. Uh, and, and again, with number needed to treats, of around in the 30s, in the low 30s, which is a fantastic number needed to treat. Oftentimes, you know, we talk about relative risk reductions and, you know, number needed treats in the several hundred for cancer screenings, et cetera. Here we have a drug that isn't, you know, we didn't really think of this, you know, this was a diabetic drug, but doesn't matter the reason for the chronic kidney disease has, has very significant benefits for all patients with kidney disease. So pretty amazing. Uh, you know, very, you know, really, really, I can't say enough about how that blows me away if I never need a treat. And we're going to touch on this briefly. So in all the trials looking at SGLT2s, not only versus placebo, but also versus other standards of care, right? At GLP-1s, et cetera, other, other medications. This was a meta-analysis and it looked at, um, hold on, it looked at over... 21 trials with over 39,000 patients, okay, with SGLT2 inhibitors compared to about 31,000, so 39,000 versus 31,000 placebo or comparative arms across 21 randomized control trials, okay? And there was a statistically significant all-cause mortality reduction, okay? So again, an all-cause mortality reduction, and it was a class effect between empagliflozin, ertaglifosin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, right? Class effect reduction in mortality. And we're talking about, you know, a hazard ratio of 0.86, so, you know, about a 14% relative reduction in mortality. But again, we're not talking about just a diabetic drug that reduces an A1C. We're talking about all-cause mortality. And, you know, I, you know, people say like, well, why didn't the individual trials all show a reduction in all-cause mortality? Well, some of the trials were pretty small, right? And the number of people 
on SGLT2s were in the 300s, and maybe only, you know, four people died in one trial or one person died in another trial. As I look through here, several different studies in the different drug classes had single digit events. But then you combine all of the events, right? And in all the trials that had significant numbers, there was all a reduction in mortality, right? And that includes cardiovascular mortality, uh, diabetic, uh, you know, you know, diabetic related mortality, kidney related mortality, all cause mortality was all seen in all these studies, but most of them were not statistically significant. Again, because even with the larger number of patients in the 2000, 3000, 4000s, the combined numbers of patients wasn't enough because the amount of deaths in these studies were so small. But when you pool all this data together, it shows a significant reduction in mortality. Now, again, this is a outcome of adding a bunch of studies that did not show statistical significance and combining them all in a meta-analysis to show st statistical significant reduction. But very, very, very good news in that, you know, we knew that there were all these extra benefits. We knew that there was diabetic, re there was a reduction in A1C. We knew there's a benefit for heart failure. We know there's a benefit in kidney disease pre prevention. But at the same time now, now we can also say this statistically, people who are on this medicine die less or live longer or have fewer more cases of mortality compared to other diabetic drugs. And this isn't all just placebo, right? This is also compared to, you know, comparative arms of whether that be GLP-1s, uh, all these trials are different. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in these studies. So again, you can't really make heads or tails say like, oh, SGLT2s are superior to GLP-1s or they're superior to your TZDs or, you know, X, Y, or Z. But you can use this as motivation to increase prescribing of this medication for all of now the effects in the class. And then there's a mortality benefit too. So again, the, the title of the, the podcast is SGLT2s are amazing drugs, except in diabetes, because they're just mediocre in diabetes, but they're amazing drugs in terms of heart failure, in terms of kidney disease, in terms of now all-cause mortality. Uh, again, I, I think there's a, a lot more to this drug class than meets the eye at initial look. And yes, uh, they are crazy expensive. And I tell patients, the patients ask me always pros and cons. I'm educating patients on these drugs when I'm trying to start them. And I say the number one con is the cost, right? If your insurance doesn't pay for these, you will not be able to afford them and we will not be able to use them. But if you can, these are great medicines because of X, Y, and Z. Yes, there are potential side effects in terms of increased urinary tract infections, general my, my uh, fungal infections of the general urinary tract. Etc. Dehydration, uh, fluid reduction, or 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 um, uh, fluid loss due to excess urination. Um, but again, the the data all says that things look really good with these drugs. So I am patiently waiting until the prices come down for all these drugs. But in the meantime, insurance companies that are covering them, um, I'm I'm very highly recommending to my patients that we start these medications for multiple multiple reasons. Um, so it, this is practice changing for me. I have changed my practice because of this. I am actually now on board with a new medication, which I never do. I'm a generic only kind of guy. And this breaks my my normal rule just because of how good these drugs are. So hopefully this was a good uh, look at the literature. Again, adding more support and more education for your patients and more education um, in terms of how good these drugs are. I'm sure in five years, we're going to find out that they cause some kind of weird brain tumor, and I'm going to have to cancel all my recommendations for these. But in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy it. And uh, as far as what we know, these are great drugs. Um, until next week, uh, or until the next time I see you, I'm not going to make any promises on next week, as you saw from a two-week break between uh, podcasts this time. Uh, this has been Dr. Mark Liss with the Primary Care Podcast. Again, you don't need to stay up all night to stay up to date. Hit me up at primarycarepod at gmail.com with any questions or thoughts. Uh, thanks and have a great week.